you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. We've already had a dozen uh, sermons in Revelation. It's hard to believe, uh, but we are on the fifth and the sixth seal. Let me give you the outline, which I guess I just really did it just then anyway. <laughs> if you'll look in your bulletin, number one, the fifth seal. And number two, the sixth seal. And uh, I praise God for the book of Revelation. Uh, even in studying it, folks, I learn something every time. I study the Word of God, and every time I teach the Word of God, uh, the Spirit illuminates something in that text that maybe I hadn't thought of before, or even something that I need to remember uh, for times ahead. You know, while Scripture reveals that God is loving, merciful, gracious, and doesn't want anyone to perish, God is also the God of judgment, and one day will judge all of mankind. The Lord will take vengeance on his enemies and reserves his wrath for his adversaries according to the word of God. There is coming uh, what the Bible calls the day of the Lord, where God will judge those on earth after the rapture of the church. The day will come beginning with the fifth seal, which will begin the second half of the tribulation called the Great Tribulation. The first four seals were the first half of the seven years of tribulation. God's full fury on mankind will be seen in extreme disasters which will take place on earth. During this time, man will see the Antichrist as he truly is, the Satan-possessed false Christ that will defile the temple and demand to be worshipped. Let's look at this prophetic scripture of times to come. And remember last week, we shared with you the four seals in the first part of chapter 6. And the four seals were uh, false peace uh, brought on by the Antichrist, war, famine, and death. And folks, during this time, uh, there will be much death, as you will see as Jesus opens the fifth seal. Revelation 6, verse 9 and when he, Jesus, opened uh, the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And we see here, again, a reflection of Matthew chapter 24. And I want to go there, Matthew 24, if you would. Flip over with me to Matthew 24 and just see the likeness here. Matthew 24 9. We said in the first eight verses were the fourth four seals. And starting at the ninth verse, this is the fifth uh, seal. And Jesus is speaking. He is preaching uh, and, and a, a message of future. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. In the first half of the tribulation, there will be death. But I am telling you, in the second half, it will, uh, you know, intensify, and there will be many, many, many more people that will die, and you will be hated by all by all nations for my name's sake. And hate will run rapid at that time, and everybody, you know, the world, uh, as in the lost people, will hate Christians, and they will hate uh, the Jewish nation. And folks, you have to understand, I hope you understand how, much, how important it is. We need to side with Israel. That, that's God's chosen people. And we need to back them. We need to pray for them. Because in the end, I am telling you, uh, it's going to make a difference. And we'll share that with you as we move on. Verse 10, and then many will be offended and betrayed by one another and will hate one another. Persecution during the second half of the tribulation will be strong. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. We've already seen in the first part of it, the Antichrist, and uh, he rears his ugly head, and, and the false prophet will, and uh, these three will deceive men and man, and people will follow them. 
all right, the Antichrist, uh, he will be uh, probably have some kind of military background. Uh, he will be a very good speaker. He will be convincing, all right? And, and even it says in the Word of God, if it were for the elect, uh, he will deceive uh, many on that day. And the reason they were persecuted, all right, and, and we'll get that. Let me finish this. Uh, verse 12, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And folks, that's why these people were not only persecuted, but they, are mar they were martyred, okay? They were martyred because of their belief in Christ and their boldness in Christ. Then in verse 15, the sixth seal here says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, and we know the holy place is the temple, whoever reads it, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He's not only uh, using this as a pro prof prof oh, prophetic excuse me, message, he is also speaking to the Jewish nation. And folks, I'm telling you, they will be severely persecuted during this time. Verse 17, let who, who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let he who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. And this persecution and this death that is coming, he is simply saying, uh, you know, if you are going to live during that time, uh, you would have to flee from Jerusalem and free from where the Antichrist is. In verse 18, and let him who is in the field not go back, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And again, the thought was not to have babies, but they would be slower. They, you know, in fleeing, there would be uh, more things, even, even possibility of miscarriages because of the fear and all that is going on during this time. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. In verse 21 was the verse I wanted to get to. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall it be. Folks, that's why it's called the great tribulation. The whole thing, the seven years, is the tribulation. But this second half is going to be unbelievable. I mean, our minds cannot be even wrapped around uh, that and what is going to take place. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Folks, there will be Christians in those days. There will be people in those days that will stand up for Christ. And when you look at these souls under, under the altar, back to Revelation chapter 6, the question has to say, why are they under the altar? And the first question that comes to my mind, what altar are they talking about? In the Old Testament, there are two altars that seems to fit this passage. The first one is the sacrificial altar. And we know that was the blood sacrifice. The blood sacrifice. And uh, the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. And once a year, he would, he would give that sacrifice and it would roll back the sins of the people for a year. But in the Old Testament, it was animals that died. And they were blood sacrifices. In the New Testament, it was Jesus Christ. He died as our sacrifice, as our sacrifice. And these martyrs who died, I believe were the ones that died during the tribulation period, during the tribulation period. And the second uh, 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 altar is the altar of incense. And that represented the prayers of the saints. And I've, in talking with these, you know, it, or, or in looking and studying this, there's two choices that you have to make there, and I kind of want to lean towards uh, the, the second one, 
But I believe also, and what I'm trying to say is, it could be a combination of those altars. Because you have uh, the, the, the blood when it drips down, and these, these Christians gave their life for Jesus Christ. They stood. And also, the prayers of the saints. Folks, I'm telling you, we as saints need to pray for the persecuted Christians in this day. Just because we don't live in a third world country doesn't mean folks are not persecuted. And Christians and missionaries die all over the world for the cause of Christ. And so that's who is under the altar, and that is why they are under the altar. And then look at the two reasons here. Who had been slain for the word of God. Even during the tribulation period, they were speaking the word of God. See, right now it cost us very little, if anything, to preach the word of God. But in those days, you are going to stick out. You are going to be uh, persecuted in the tribulation days. And then it says the second thing, and for the testimony which they held. And folks, they did not deny Christ. They were still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why they were martyrs. They were martyrs. And then it says in verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? And we know down through history, uh, even in biblical history, men and women died for the cause of Christ. And the one that sticks out to me in the New Testament is Stephen. And him and his prayer is different than these prayers. You remember Stephen, we don't have time to go there, but he basically said the same thing that Jesus said. Do not charge these folks with this crime. And he died in peace. He died just pretty much like Jesus has died, which Jesus said, Father, forgive them. But folks, during this time, it is a totally different situation. God is avenging. God is punishing. God is judging. And at this time, it's going to be hard, hard to be a Christian. And so here you can see they weren't wanting vengeance because really when it talks of vengeance, the Bible says vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. They were just wanting justice, okay, justice. And there's a difference between those two. And so here they are just saying they're asking the question. And folks, we can answer that question, uh, you know, you know in, even in reading this. Folks, only God knows when this is going to begin. Only God knows when the rapture of the church begins. Only God knows the calendar, that prophetic calendar that is laid out in Revelation. And it hasn't started yet. But I am telling you, folks, we are getting really, really close to the rapture of the church. So we see verse, 13, verse 11. Then a white robe was given to each of them. What does that mean? What does a white robe represent? Folks, it represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am not righteous. You are not righteous on your own. We take on, when we invite Jesus Christ into our lives, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we are like Him. And it's not just a reward. It is a sign of righteousness, of purity, and of holiness. And these folks paid the price. It's not that they earned it. It's just because they were saved, because they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this was uh, an identification of who they were and what they were about. And it was said to them, that they should rest a little longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was complete. So what is the response? And, and you think about this in, in, in what he is saying. 
back in verse 10. Notice how they address the Lord. Holy and true. Folks, I'm telling you, we cannot in our mind grasp true holiness. I mean, when you think of God, you think of perfection. When you think of Jesus, you think of perfection. Everything He does is holy. Everything He does is pure. His motives is pure. Everything about God in Jesus is holy. And not only is He holy, He is true. True to what? The Word of God. To the Word of God. God inspired the writing of Holy Scripture. And if God inspired it, and God promises it, it will happen. It doesn't matter what man says. It doesn't matter uh, certain interpretations, all right? And, and, and a lot of people are just almost afraid of revelation because of the sim symbolism and the, the interpretations there. But I am telling you, God gave us this scripture and this book as a warning of things to come. Because there's no pressure right now if you think about it. We live under grace. We live under grace. And I'm telling you, sometimes we take grace and, and we take advantage of grace. And, and there are a lot of people that just says, uh, we've got time, we've got time. And anybody that says this nowadays has not read carefully the Word of God. The time is coming. That day of great tribulation is coming, and we need to be ready. And the second part of that is, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as was completed. What does that mean? People have already died for the cause of Christ. They're under the altar. They have the white robes on, but there are still people during the great tribulation that will die. And again, you have to understand, that's why it's called the great tribulation. All right? Everything starts happening at that time. I'm, I'm just telling you, when the Antichrist shows himself for who he is, when the Antichrist breaks that seven-year promise uh, you know, of peace, everything changes. The 10 European nations will gather, and basically it's, it's the old Roman Empire, and they will gather with the Antichrist, and they will be against two folks. They will be against Israel, and they will be against the Christians. And that's when I'm telling you, these cause, you know, these, these worldwide disasters are going to begin. Matter of fact, Daniel chapter 9. Go with me if you would to Daniel 9. I want you to see this. Daniel 9, 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant, talking about the Antichrist, with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations, he shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And folks, he will not only uh, take uh, the altars and take them away and the sacrifices and take them away, I am telling you, uh, he will desecrate the temple. He will build a God, a statue of himself, and he will demand every, everyone to worship him and he will claim to be God. And this is what introduces, that particular time will introduce the sixth seal. The sixth seal. So let's look at verse 12. And I looked, and when he opened the seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. In the sixth seal, you will see six natural disasters. And again, even when uh, tornadoes hit and when... Uh, you know, earthquakes, you know, and different natural disasters uh, happen. Even insurance companies say it was a natural disasters, but disaster. But this will be at an epic scale. It'll be an earthquake like never seen before. 
It will be devastating. It will literally tear uh, the, the, the earth crust in two. And these earthquakes will happen all over the place. And uh, this time, uh, which we are talking about, begins the day of the Lord or the great tribulation. Matter of fact, hold your finger there and go to Joel chapter 2. I want to keep you in tune with the Old Testament and the prophetic words uh, that, are, that are given in the Old Testament. And if you look at the heading here, it's called the day of the Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. And folks, when these things start happening, when these earthquakes like never before is seen, I am telling you, fear will break out on earth. I mean, people will literally be shaking from fear. These are things that have never been caught on camera. These are things that uh, never have been uh, at such an uh, intense scale as this. And again, folks, it's the wrath of God. Yes, God is loving. Yes, God is full of grace. Yes, he wants you saved. But I'm telling you, when it comes to this point, all right, he is punishing the lost world. He is punishing those who have denied Christ. He is punishing those who have shaken uh, their, their fist in the face of Christ and God. And so we see these earthquakes that happen. And the second thing, and the sun became uh, black as sackcloth of hair. Well, what could happen from that? Well, these earthquakes will probably start the volcano activity. And we know, again, if the earthquakes were crazy, you know, and, and intense, the volcanoes would be also. So we have these, this separation of the earth going on. And what it literally says, it shook the whole earth, okay? And right now, earthquakes are just in certain places. You will have them all over the world, but it's just in certain places. In this time, the earth, the earth will shake and everyone will feel it. Everyone, and, and again, I don't know the the seismograph and all that, but I'm telling you, I'm sure it'll be well over nine or 10 and it will get everybody's attention. And then when the volcanic ash spews out of the earth, it will blacken the sun and the sackcloth of hair. And of course, that was black, if you remember, and another sign of darkness. There will be darkness on the earth. And folks, you know that Satan represents darkness. He represents darkness. And the moon became like blood. So we see these things, these supernatural disasters taking place on earth. And we see the moon will be affected. Everything, everything that you see, everything that we know earth as will be changed. And then it says in verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as fig trees drop its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. So we see these earthquakes affect all the world. Well, what would be stars falling from heaven? Well, folks, it'll probably be meteors or asteroids. And you think about meteors and you think about them landing. I mean, you know, there is some that have hit places and gone through roofs and you know, hit, hit the earth, and they have seen the small ones that have done that. But I believe at this time, it will be as meteors or just like rain. They are coming down out of the sky. And you don't, they, they really won't know what to do. Because if you think about it, if it's as, uh, you know, big as uh, the Bible's describing it, there is no place that you can hide. It would literally destroy a house. And a lot of them would destroy towns. So you see people just scattering and trying to get underground and, uh, you know, and trying to protect themselves from these things that are happening. And then he gives the example of the fig tree. It is shaken by a mighty wind. So not only the earthquakes, all right, we're talking about, and, and folks, I grew up in Oklahoma 
and from Oklahoma City uh, to Tulsa and, and, and right through between Tulsa and Lawton, uh, it's called Tornado Alley. And I was within two blocks one time when we were young of a tornado. And I am telling you, it is incredible. It is just crazy. But even at that, this is going to be on a grander stage than that. And folks, we need to understand that. We need to understand what is coming. And look at verse 14. Then the sky receded as a scroll rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved at its place. When you think of a scroll unrolling, y'all remember the old shades, the blinds that you had where they were darkening or they were white shades, and it had, a, it had something in the top of it, some kind of spring, and you pull those up. Well, if you weren't careful, you pulled it too much, it would go all the way up and go, right. anybody know? Who's, who's, who's my age and remembers that? There you go. Senior adults, there we go. Folks, it'll be as chicken little. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. All right? It'll be crazy, crazy here on earth. Folks, this is not made up stuff. It is the Word of God. This is not Hollywood at its best. It's the Word of God. These things are going to happen. You say, why? why are you covering all this? Because we need to warn others that this day is coming. This day is coming, not out of fear, out of fact. And folks, what we have to understand is that's where faith is. That's what faith is. God is going to take care of his own. He'll protect them. And mountains and islands with mood out of its place. Where a mountain was, it's not going to be anymore. Verse 15, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, and the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in caves and in the rocks of the mountains. There's seven groups of leaders and seven groups in this list. And most of them have leading positions, except for the last few, talking about uh, slaves there. What are they saying? Even the people in charge during this time are going to run with fear. Those people, and, and man, I thank God for our military my father-in-law is a was a marine colonel, and you know that it was rah rah. All right, all right. They weren't scared of nothing. All right, and and again at that time, it's saying I don't care who you are, I don't care how much power you have, you will be under God. You will be under the wrath of God. There is no place that you can run. There is no place that you can hide. Isn't it funny? I always get, I always, always chuckle about Adam and Eve. They had sinned, and they were in bushes hiding from God. Now, how dumb is that? Okay, I'm glad they put some leaves and clothes on, but you, you're not going to hide from God. And folks, the same thing is true during this great tribulation. All right, these huge events, these you know, just crazy phenomena are going to happen. And it is the wrath of God. In verse 16, And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the land. It takes this kind of thing happening for the lost world to finally say, You know what? There is a God. Here's a God. And this God that y'all serve, he's mad. It's obviously, it's obvious he is angry. Okay? And, and they will literally say, we know who did this. We know why they did this. Because even us preachers, <laughs> okay, we preach the truth. And, you know, sometimes people will look at us and say, you know, man, you got fired up today. Well, why wouldn't I be fired up? Why wouldn't I be excited about 
the second coming of Christ and in the rapture of the church. Why wouldn't I? Why? Because I know, folks, I believe with all my heart, this stuff's going to happen. And we need to be ready for it. And it says, verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Can I answer that for you? Nobody. Nobody. You're not getting out of it. You're not getting a pass. You're not going to throw yourself at the mercy of the court. You're not going to buy your way out of it. You're not going to pray your way out of it. Because some people, even lost people, will start praying, folks. I guarantee you when they need something, they will start praying. But they will face an almighty God, and they will stand before the God of this Bible. That's the fact. That's the Word of God. Fear will grip all of mankind to where, folks, I hope you understand what it says. People literally would rather die. They, they were just saying, this is lost people said, I would just, I, I just want to die. This is so bad. This is horrible. I want to die. And what doesn't make sense to me in all of this is Jesus came. Jesus, uh, uh, you know, he, he showed himself, revealed himself to everyone there, and we have the word of God. But yet people still ignore the life of Jesus and the word of God. If these people would just understand, your only hope is Jesus. Your only hope is asking God for forgiveness and by faith putting your trust in him. But even at this time, people turn their backs on God and shake their fist in the face of God and get mad at God. Folks, there's no reason for you to get mad at God. You lose when you do that, I'm telling you. There's no reason to be mad at God because he has given you salvation. And if that's the only thing he's given you, he's given you things that money cannot buy. That's salvation. That is peace of mind. That is love. That is friendship. That is him watching over us and protecting us. So we see nobody will be able to stand against God. Matthew 24. Go with me. Two scriptures left. Matthew 24. Verse 42, watch therefore. Folks, you better be watching. You better be watching. You do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Nobody knows. Jesus doesn't even know. If you read the scripture carefully, soon, soon, he is going to turn, turn over to Jesus and say, go get your bride. Go get your bride. When that last person is saved in this time of grace, that will start, I believe, the rapture of the church. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what, the, what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not allowed uh, his house to be broken into. It's never happened that I know of. Thief calls you up and says, y'all going to be out of town this weekend? Y'all going to be on vacation this week? Why? I'm going to break into your house. <laughs> now, how dumb is that? And we, and I say we, people, are, have that mentality that I got time. I've got time. I've got time. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And you do not know. Do you realize that today could be your last day on earth? I'm not trying to scare anybody, but nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. We don't know. I guarantee you, I don't know how many people will die today, but most of them have no clue that today was their day. So Jesus says to be ready. Then 2 Peter 3 and this is the application of what we have read today, the application. 310, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, Second Peter 310, 
in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. We talked about it. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. We will talk about that also in the future. And both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Folks, everything that you can see will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct in godliness. That's the application. We as Christians are here on the earth. If, if, you know, he, he, if he wanted to, folks, he could have raptured us out the minute we got saved. But he called the disciples, and we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And he asked us to be holy, which is like him, in our conduct and in our godliness so that we live such a holy life that people will literally ask us, why didn't you get mad? Why, why didn't you say something to that person? Why, why did you act like, why, why are you giving? Why are you doing these things? Why do you go to church every Sunday? And that will give us opportunity. Our lives will give us opportunity to share the gospel with people around us. Now look at verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And do you realize that we can hasten the coming of the Lord? Every time somebody gets saved, we are getting closer to that last person. We are getting closer because of which the heavens will dissolve, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Oh, folks, heaven, perfection, God, worship, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, no temptation, no sin, no pain, no lies, no deception, light 100% of the time, glorified bodies. Can I go on and on? Folks, when we get the what I call the mully grubs, oh me, oh preacher, you don't know how bad it is. All right? Folks, I'm telling you, the worse it gets is those who deny Jesus Christ and spend an eternity in hell. You don't know how bad it could be. But God has promised us heaven. So what should, should, what, what should we do? Just tell the truth. Share the gospel. Live a life that is pleasing to God. And let people know Jesus is coming again. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for your word. And God, I thank you that it's not man's opinion. God, is your holy word. And God, my prayer today is that if there's one here that doesn't know you, that today the Holy Spirit would convict them and they would come forward and they would give their heart and their life to Jesus Christ. The day is coming. A great tribulation is coming. A day of reckoning. A day of judgment. A day of heartache and pain for many. But God, I pray that they would realize that freely Christ gave his life. His blood paid for their sins. And if they'll make Jesus Lord and accept him into their life, they can be free from this pain and this sorrow. And God, I pray for the Christians. God, I just pray, Lord, that we will live our lives that are pleasing to you, that we will hasten the day of the Lord. And God, that we will be holy because you are holy. Lord, if there's those who need to come for baptism or even join this church, God, I just pray that you would just speak to them also. God, this is your church. This is your time. And God, I pray that you would just bless this time that we have. God, we love you, we praise you, and we give you glory for anything good that's going on in our church and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?